Hello YouTube. Bane666 here. As most of you probably know, I started this series of videos to expose the lie that Elliot Roger was connected to the men's rights movement. But I am now expanding it to cover any falsehoods, misconceptions, misinformation, or outright lies spread about the MRM. So let's get stuck into it. This series has focused on a lot of negativity in the media, and from online feminists, but I'm going to start this episode with a positive that should be highlighted and acknowledged. It's about an individual who represented what feminism should be, and unfortunately is not. From The Atlantic The feminist leader who became a men's rights activist. Karen DeCrow served as president of the National Organization for Women, but she often broke with feminist orthodoxy. Well. What can I say? This is going to be interesting. Karen DeCrow, the feminist attorney and author who served as president of the National Organization for Women from 1974 to 1977, died of melanoma last Friday at 76. Although her passing was widely noted in the media, most the obituaries and tributes overlooked the more unorthodox aspects of her work. A lifelong champion of women's rights, De Croo was nonetheless skeptical about many key aspects of Latter-day feminism, including its focus on sexual violence and male abuse of women. She was also, for much of her career, a men's rights activist. De Croo raised eyebrows in 1981 when she served as defense counsel to Frank Sapico, the former New York detective and whistleblower, in a paternity suit. Serpico claimed the plaintiff had used him as a sperm bank and lied about being on the pill while knowingly trying to conceive, and asserted that he had a constitutional right not to become a parent against his will. The family court judge, a woman, ruled in Serpico's favor, but he lost on appeal. De Croo, by then a lawyer in private practice in Syracuse, New York, endorsed Serpico's argument on feminist grounds. Just as the Supreme Court has said that women have the right to choose whether or not to be parents, men should also have that right, she told the New York Times, calling this, the only logical feminist position to take. Pretty amazing stuff, right? And before anyone asks, no this isn't an April Fool's article. It seems, she was actually a feminist who believed in equality for both men and women, and presumably didn't subscribe to the patriarchy theory branch of feminism. But let's read on. Quite a few feminists disagreed. Marjorie D. Fields, then co-chair of Governor Mario Cuomo's task force on domestic violence and later a family court judge, described the defense tactics in the case as almost a classic anti-woman presentation that women seduce and entrap men with their feminine wiles. De Croo was unfazed. In a 1982 letter to the Times, she wrote that since men have no legal power to either veto or compel an abortion, it is only just that they shouldn't have to pay for a woman's unilateral decision to bring the pregnancy to term, or, put another way, autonomous women making independent decisions about their lives should not expect men to finance their choice. What can I say about that? Outstanding. Next. De Croo also championed men's rights as fathers arguing for a rebuttable presumption of shared custody after divorce. She worked with the Fathers' Rights Association of New York State and joined the board of the Children's Rights Council, a pro-joint custody group. More recently, she was on the board of Leading Women for Shared Parenting. In an ironic twist, one of her fellow Leading Women for Shared Parenting board members was her old nemesis Phyllis Schlafly, whom De Croo frequently debated on college campuses in the 1980s and 1990s. Once again, outstanding. This is what feminism should look like. If it did, then there would be no need for MRAs or others to attack it, in fact the two sides could work together for the betterment of everyone. Next. Again, De Croo framed her position as a feminist one, arguing that getting men more involved in parenting was essential if women were to achieve equality in other pursuits. A good explanation of her views on the subject is in a 1982 speech she gave to the National Congress of Men, reprinted in the newsletter of the Greater Syracuse Chapter of Now. Plenty of feminists have endorsed this idea when it comes to things like equal parental leave or shared responsibility for housework and child care. Gloria Steinem has said that, 
women are not going to be equal outside the home until men are equal in it. But few are willing to take the extra step of framing custody in terms of men's rights, or siding with men against women who wanted sole custody. This is exactly right. Please keep this in mind for the second segment of this video. De Croo was willing to do it, and to say that many divorced mothers whose professional lives would benefit from shared custody were unreasonably opposed to this option, not only because of the social stigma of being viewed as bad moms, but out of sheer hostility toward their ex-husbands. In a 1984 Father's Day column, De Croo described a conversation with a client, a divorced mother of three who was having childcare troubles because of an unusual work schedule. What about the father? I asked. Is he willing to take them during those hours? Their father? She exclaimed. That's just what he wants. You know, if we lived in a world filled with feminists like Karen De Croo, instead of feminists like Andrea Dworkin, I could spend my time on YouTube doing movie reviews, or debunking conspiracy theories. Oh well. Next. To some feminists, this may sound like a troubling echo of misogynistic stereotypes of the spiteful ex-wife. But to De Croo, it was a human issue, not a gendered one. In a 1994 interview, she lamented that, in the battle between the sexes, men and women will go practically to the end of the earth in a logical, irrational ways to give each other pain. It's telling that De Croo saw such behavior as mutual. She was also sympathetic to the controversial argument that domestic violence is a two-way street. In the 1970s, she had fought sexist rape laws that allowed victims to be questioned about their chastity. In the early 1990s, she applauded Katie Royf's critique of rape crisis feminism, the morning after, as a courageous challenge to a new puritanism that depicted women as perpetual victims of male predation. Recalling the bad old days when girls were taught to deny both their brains and their sexuality, De Croo was tangibly impatient with the idea that, being whistled at, or even slurped at amounted to, oppression. Fantastic. Take that Tumblr feminist. Next. There were other heresies, too. De Croo, who started her feminist journey by fighting sex discrimination in the workplace, contributed a foreword to Warren Farrell's 2005 book, why Men Earn More, which argued that the pay gap is due largely to men and women's different workplace behavior and career choices. Understanding these patterns, De Croo believed, could help women's advancement. The message aside, she was quietly bucking the party line by the mere fact of her collaboration with Farrell, who served on the board of NOW's New York City chapter during her presidency but was excommunicated from the women's movement over his championship of men's liberation. You know, the more of this article I read, the more I like her. Next. De Croo herself was increasingly at odds with the organization she had once led, though she never broke with it. By the mid-1990s, Now was openly hostile to the father's rights movement, arguing that women were the real victims of bias in family courts. An action alert, issued at the group's 1996 annual conference compared father's rights activists to batterers seeking control over women. A resolution three years later made it NOW's official policy to champion women's interests in divorce and custody cases and counter the undue influence of father's group. De Croo, then head of NOW's Greater Syracuse chapter, refrained from criticizing these moves. In 2000, she told me she had heard about the resolution but hadn't read it and couldn't comment. In his tribute to De Croo on LW4SP's blog, Farrell wrote that she walked tightrope not wanting to alienate feminist friends and colleagues. Okay, I should explain something here. Segment 2 of this video, which you will watch in a little while, was originally meant to be the first segment of part 12 in this series, but when I was sent a link to a rant by Shati Binks, I decided to push it back to the second segment. But, the Shati rebuttal took longer than expected, so it has now been moved to segment 2 of this video, part 13. You are no doubt asking, why am I telling you all this? It's because in that segment, which you will view in a little while, I cover the NOW Action Alert, as well as NOW's anti-father policies. Unfortunately, NOW seems to have taken down the alert from their site, and all links to it are dead, including the one in this article about Karen DeCrow. Next. 
she certainly never stopped being a feminist. She also never abandoned the belief often seen in recent years as a quaint relic of 1970s unisex feminism that men and women are far more alike than different. But if she refused to see biology as destiny, she was equally skeptical of patriarchy as destiny. In the 1994 Chicago Tribune essay on Naomi Wolf's Fire with Fire, she proposed to take gender out of the gender debate and focus on the human. Questioning whether men really have more power over their lives than women do, Wolf is accurate and on target when she writes that women must move from a self-image of weakness to one of strength. But if we fail to see that which glares before our eyes, that men have frailties as we do, we only will be batting point five zero zero. Fantastic! You know, whenever a feminist starts to read you the dictionary definition of feminism, while telling you that men have no issues, and that women need to smash the patriarchy, you should tell them to put down the poison cool aid, and direct them to this article. Because this is what an actual feminist who is interested in equality looks like, not their brand of victimhood cultism. Next. I first met De Crow in 1994, when we were both featured in Jack Cameron's Goodwill Toward Men, a collection of interviews with women about the male side of gender issues, and did some publicity for the book together. We saw each other on a few more occasions, as speakers at Children's Rights Council conferences and some other events. I still remember an anecdote from one of her speeches, meant to illustrate unthinking reliance on tradition. When she got married and started to cook, she would always chop off the ends of a meatloaf before putting it in the oven, as she seen her mother do. When her husband asked why, she was at a loss. She had simply assumed that was the proper way to bake meatloaf. Her mother didn't know either, she had always seen her mother do it the same way. The grandmother's explanation turned out to be very simple, because our oven was so small, that was the only way it could fit in. It was a very Karen de Crow story, not only in its good-natured wit but in its view of traditional roles not as a malevolent system designed to oppress, but as something that had outlived its usefulness and needlessly hemmed people in. Which is exactly the way I see it. Traditional roles serve a purpose for the majority of human history, but are not relevant anymore. And that's both for males and females. Unfortunately, feminism, or to be more exact, those feminists who follow patriarchy theory, have used traditional roles as a means to demonize masculinity, as well as to sell the tale of universal female oppression. Which is obviously a distorted view of both history and reality. Next. Unfortunately, we lost contact after that. Just recently, with all the gender warfare in the news, I had been thinking of the crow, I didn't know she was ill, and wondering if I should get in touch and get her perspective. I did not agree with the crow on everything, among other things, while I share her concern for equal justice on the subject of unwanted paternity, I think she may have underestimated the complexities of the issue, but her voice is the kind sorely missing from today's feminist discourse. In her guest columns for the Syracuse Post Standard in her final years, she celebrated women's gains and stressed that there was more progress to be made, but she honored men as parents and partners, noted that, fathers still have a difficult time being recognized as equal parents, and wrote, we should cease thinking about men as the enemy of children and women. Once again, she hits the nail on the head, one of my major criticisms of modern-day feminism, is its constant portrayal as men as the enemy. As long as mainstream feminism sees men as the problem, I will see feminism as toxic to men. We really do need more Karen de Crows. Next. De Crows forward to why men earn more, her last text to appear in a book, concluded, we have been working for gender equality for a short time, given the span of human history. Eventually, it will even up. I am very hopeful. She always believed that fulfilling this hope requires looking at both sides of gender issues. As we say goodbye to this pioneer of modern feminism, we should ask ourselves if it is the movement's loss that it did not follow her direction. I would go as far as to say, it's not just feminism's loss, but society's loss in general. Could you imagine if all the time and effort put into fighting bullshit and toxic ideology could be put towards constructive ends? If both sides could work together? Unfortunately it will never happen so long as there are feminists screaming their favorite word, 
patriarchy. Speaking of which, Hello YouTube. Oh look, it's a young Sayo Polani. This should be interesting. I, I find it interesting that I um, I have all these people who are men's rights activists on my page uh, continually telling me how oppressed they are. Really? Actually using the word oppressed? So I checked out one of Lynn Johnson's recent videos, titled, MRAs in the Atheist Community. There were only six comments including comments by Lynn. Not only are none of the commenters clearly identifiable as MRAs, but no one uses the word oppression, or oppressed. Now considering the title and subject of the video involve men's rights, I thought this would be a good place to start, but let's look at another video. So let's have a look at, regarding, feminists finally declare that all vaginal sex is rape. Lynn says right at the start. I'm just banning nameless, faceless, MRA cowards from here on out. Call me a Nazi if you want to, but if you have to resort to referring to feminists as a political group that sought to exterminate entire groups of people, then I'm really not going to take you seriously, anyways. And doing a search through all 24 comments, I found no mention of the word oppression, or men's rights, or MRA, apart from the one time it's used in Lynn's own comment. But back to Lynn's comment. It is possible that there were MRAs in her comments section using the word oppression, and Lynn deleted them. It's also possible that Lynn made it up. It's also possible that the people she blocked were just anti-feminists, and not MRAs, as although most MRAs tend to be anti-feminist, not all anti-feminists are MRAs. Unfortunately individuals like Lynn don't seem to understand this. It's also possible that no one used the word oppression, and Lynn just projected it onto them. But I'll tell you what, I'll give Lynn one last chance, let's look at the comments to Lynn's YouTube channel. Oh, that's disappointing, only one comment, and obviously not an MRE. I guess Lynn could have deleted them, but we have no way of knowing. There are three possibilities here. 1. Lynn is telling the truth, and the commenters were not only MREs, but used the word oppression. Two. Lynn was mistaken, and presumed they were MRAs, and or, projected the word oppression on them. 3. Lynn made the whole thing up. Unfortunately for Lynn, that which can be claimed without evidence, can also be dismissed without evidence. And considering I'm yet to see an MRA ever claim oppression, I'm going to call this one a fail. Next time Lynn, take screen captures. Because they don't win in custody battles, and there's no male domestic violence shelters, and just, you know, all this stuff where apparently women get some kind of pass where men don't. Yes, these are issues, but no one is claiming they are oppression. For fuck's sake, when are feminists and social justice warriors going to realize that a group doesn't need to be oppressed to have issues? It just goes to show how warped their view of the world is, where female issues equals tyrannical oppression, but male issues equals insignificance. And remember, these people claim to be for equality for everyone. Um, <clears throat> part of the reason this is funny is the fact that, oh, and the draft, they, they mentioned the draft too, and part of the reason this is funny is because, you know, I was designated male at birth, I recognize systems of oppression that are patriarchal in nature, and I work to dismantle those systems. Oh, so you are delusional from drinking too much poison cool aid then? Okay, got it. Next. That's what feminists do. And so when, when men's rights activists come to me and complain about how there are no domestic violence shelters for men, or the fact that male sexual assault and rape victims are not taken seriously, or the, the fact that they, the men are more likely to lose custody battles, I continually try to explain to them that they are the result of patriarchal ideas. Oh, I see. So women's problems are caused by men. And men's problems are caused by men. So men are always the problem, and feminism is the solution. Okay, got it. Because that doesn't sound like a gendered stereotype, does it? I get so sick of the patriarchy backfiring argument. Next. 
the the fact that they are not taken seriously or the fact that they they feel oppressed in these areas has nothing to do with women or feminism it has to do with the fucking patriarchy and i realize that sounds like a a crazy nutbag conspiracy theorist idea finally something we agree on the way i say it but when it comes right down to it think about it you have a, a man and a woman getting divorced they have three kids and you know the the mras make the claim that the uh what woman in the relationship generally speaking um gets the kids in the custody battle um i don't know about any statistics or anything like that got it facts aren't important you'll go far as a feminist but th what it generally comes down to is the fact that we live in a patriarchal society where women are viewed as the better caregivers for children oh got it so we should change the law to forcibly deny custody to women which would allow them to spend more time working on their careers this would obviously help smash the patriarchy yeah I'm sure no woman will have any problem with that. Unless, of course, some gender stereotypes not only help women, but are also enforced by women. No, couldn't be that. It's a patriarchal idea. It's not... It's not feminists walking into courtrooms and saying, Men can't have children! Let me start the rebuttal of this nonsense by pointing out that feminism has been actively talking down the necessity of fathers for decades. For example, recently Father's Day cards were banned in Scotland. And then we have wonderful articles like this one, pointing out that fathers aren't really necessary. I mean the title is literally, Are Fathers Necessary? A paternal contribution may not be as essential as we think. But that's actually pretty mild stuff to be honest, when it's compared to this. Fathers are necessary, finally getting off the patriarchal bullshit bandwagon. Interesting isn't it, that Lynn in her video, described fathers not getting custody as part of the patriarchy, yet here we have a feminist saying that fathers being seen as necessary is part of patriarchy. So which is it? Does patriarchy see fathers as both necessary and unnecessary at the same time? And both of these options are forms of female oppression? This game is starting to sound a little bit rigged to me. But let's read on. Fathers are necessary, finally getting off the patriarchal bullshit bandwagon. Not many people will argue against the necessity of having a father in one's life. We have been so ingrained to accept this as a fact that to challenge this assertion would seem absurd. Everyone from from religious persons to psychologists will tell you how important a father is in a child's development. But they have been lying. It has been a social control mechanism. Ah, but get ready for the backlash. Men don't like being told that they aren't important, and the women who support these notions, love to support these men meaning, they, the women, will be angry, too. But this could be one lone feminist nut job right? I mean, not all feminists are like that, right? Let's have a look at now, the National Organization for Women. Crisis in Family Courts there is a national crisis for women and their children in the family law courts of this country. Affirmed by experts and leaders in the women's movement, the existence of this crisis is verified by women in every state who report injustice in their family law cases, especially battered mothers trying to protect their children from abusive fathers who aggressively litigate against them, using family court to stalk, harass, punish, and impoverish their former partners and children now recognizes this crisis for women and their children and seeks to address discrimination against women in family courts. I would agree that the family court is in crisis, and that some ex-spouses are abusive and use the family court system to abuse, punish and harass their ex. But you'll note that now assigns gender roles to these actions, males always as the actors, the abusers, the victimizers, and females as the acted upon, the abused, the victim. Reality outside of this feminist gender politics minefield, is a little different. You see, I believe in equality, which means I accept that women are capable of shitty behavior, just like men. I don't deny men are capable of evil, I just know women are as well. Now, seems to miss this point. 
While doing research, I also came across this about now, on the National Parents Organization. The interesting points are, whereas the success of these groups will be harmful to all women but especially harmful to battered and abused women and children. And, therefore be it resolved that the National Organization for Women, now, begin a national alert to inform members about these fathers' rights groups and their objectives through articles in the National Now Times. And, be it further resolved that, as a part of this alert, now establish a clearinghouse for related information by sharing with now state and local chapters the available means to challenge such groups, including the current research on custody and support, sample legislation, expert witnesses, and work done by now and other groups in states where fathers' rights groups have been active. And, be it further resolved, that now encourage state and local chapters to conduct and coordinate divorce custody court watch projects to facilitate removal of biased judges. It should be noted that I could not find an original source for these statements made by now. My search led me to many fathers' advocacy websites, but every time I found a link to the original source, that link was dead. It seems the alert by now was posted in 1999, and that page has since been removed. I also found these comments attributed to now, in a book called, Throw Away Dads. I don't normally like to include information that can't be 100% confirmed, but in this case, considering it's very much in line with what's actually on the now website, I thought I would present it here and let you make up your own mind. And of course, if you know of a screen capture of the original source, please link below. But I suspect that all original sources have long since been deleted. Next. It's a, a fem, it's a, uh, it's a patriarchal sexist ideology. That's what I don't understand. Okay, so the National Organization for Women is propagating patriarchal sexist ideology. Right. Got it. Fuck that patriarchy gets into everything. Next. And feminists are working to dismantle that, for the most part, because, I will admit, when it comes to, excuse me, I haven't even had my coffee yet, when it comes to MRAs, bashing feminists for these things, I mean, it's always the fact that, you know, they're complaining about these perceived oppressions, but... Once again, oppression isn't our word, it's yours. There is only one group of privileged individuals who are crying oppression, and it isn't us. Next. Working against the people, feminists, for the most part, who are working to dismantle those systems of oppression. And by dismantle those systems of oppression, you mean deny fathers custody of their children. Got it. Next. And yes, there are some people who call themselves feminists who are really fucked up and sexist. But? But that's with any group of people. So that's the reason why we don't consider all Muslims terrorists, because not all Muslims are strapping bombs to themselves. That's the same reason that we don't consider all Christians anti-queer bigots, because not all Christians are anti-queer bigots. In every single group. There is a fringe minority that just fucking makes makes it to where everyone, well not everyone, I shouldn't speak in absolutes like that, where a lot of people start bad-mouthing them. I agree that every group has its bad apples. But the difference with feminism is that the good apples are the silent minority. And based on that, they, they badmouth the majority based on that fringe. I find it interesting when feminists use the, not all feminists are like that line, and claim that it's only a couple of people out on the fringe, and that we shouldn't judge an entire group based on what a few people do, while simultaneously claiming that all MRAs are bad because of a handful of misquotes from Paul Ellum, and false claims about Elliot Roger. Although to be fair, Lynn hasn't done that yet. Next. So that's what MRAs do when they complain about feminists that supposed, that, who are supposedly oppressing them. Oh, I see. Not all feminists are like that, but all MRAs are. Got it. And seriously, stop using the word oppression. They are complaining about a fringe who doesn't even know what they're talking about, who doesn't march to the same beat as the majority of feminists on the planet. And by fringe, 
Do you mean people like Andrea Dworkins? Or Gloria Steinem? Or Jermaine Greer? Or Susan Brown Miller? Or Mary Daly? Or Robin Morgan? Or Catherine McKinnon? Just name a handful. Are we to believe that these women were just a fringe, and had no significant influence on modern-day feminism? Really? The way some feminists edit their history is right out of George Orwell's 1984. So, that's basically, I mean, so basically I've talked about the, uh, the, the ways in which men's rights activists complain about oppressive, um, they, they complain about being oppressed while blaming other people than their oppressors. And I'm seriously getting annoyed with these false claims about oppression. Stop fucking projecting your brand of victimhood cultism onto us. We have issues, not oppression, no one is claiming otherwise, at least in our group. And I've talked about the fact that there is a fringe minority within the feminist community that, well, not within, but there's a fringe minority on the outskirts of the feminist community. That Which you are now shielding and protecting by attacking those who criticize it thus making you part of the problem that are by and large not accepted by the majority of feminists and they're basically akin to if a feminist somebody who calls themselves a feminist says that something like all vaginal sex is rape classify them the same way you would anyone from the westboro baptist church all you have to do i'll go one better any feminists that claims that middle class western women are oppressed or uses the term patriarchy is in fact a radical. Not to mention devoid of any logical faculties. And walk away. So yeah, basically, men's rights activists complain about being oppressed while attacking the people who are working to dismantle the oppressive systems, and then they complain about, um, then they complain about a fringe group of feminists who really do hate men. And they're stupid. They're assholes. Folks, this is what drinking the poison Kool-Aid does to you. Sad, really. They're comparable to the Westboro Baptist Church of anti-gay churches. So, that's that. Also, if you are a nameless, faceless coward coming to my videos and posting MRA bullshit, from now on, I have a just a one one band policy. If you don't have your name, and you don't have your face, fuck you. A bit harsh, don't you think? Although, to be fair, she can do what she wants on her own channel. Personally, I'm more interested in someone's argument than their name or picture. And to be honest, what's stopping anyone from creating a fake account with a phony pic? Maybe we should all have to get notarized pictures of our passports, along with three references, before we as MRAs are allowed to leave a comment. No matter how logical, well-researched, or polite that comment may be. Ah, don't you love the feminist echo chamber? Hello again. This is kind of a postscript uh, to the video I just recorded. Um, I am... I, I mentioned in my video that I am designated... I was designated male at birth. And... I am... quite obviously... a queer individual. <laughs> I am uh, trans feminine and gender queer. I so when, when I hear MRA MRA bullshit about how oppressed they are, because um, at least in the workplace, one of the things that comes to the table is their physical appearance, how they're required by the workplace to have short hair and they can't wear makeup. Not actually, not only am I an MRA, but I also have long hair. And although it is a double standard that some workplaces frown upon males with long hair, it's hardly an issue at the top of our list. There are much more important issues, like the sentencing gap, and male genital mutilation, just to give two examples. But no, go ahead and discuss something trivial instead of real issues. ...saying that they would want to, but usually, I mean, it's just, they always come up with bullshit that has nothing to do with feminists. So... But yeah, okay, so I was designated, designated male at birth, but somehow I can understand 
that my oppression doesn't come from cisgender women. My oppression comes from the patriarchy. If I can figure that out, why can't, in, why can't these MRAs, who were designated male at birth, and not to mention that they never seem to complain about the troubles of black men who are continually getting shot up by police. They never seem to want to talk about the, the issues faced by trans men. No, because we talk about the issues of all men. It's not only whites who are being circumcised. In fact, we routinely speak out about the horrendous advocacy for male circumcision by the UN in Africa. The sentencing gap doesn't affect only white men. In fact, it affects black men on an even larger scale. And of course, fathers' rights is a massive problem in the black community in America. Just name three issues. So how are we not advocating for black men, or gay men, or whatever other group of men? This is just a pathetic attempt to brand us as bigots. Who are, you know, continually put under the, uh, who are continually dealing with systematic discrimination and oppression. They never, uh, and when it comes to male sexual assault victims, they never bring that up unless there's a feminist talking about rape culture. And then they blame the feminists for the treatment of the male sexual assault victim. The standard feminist rhetoric about rape is, it's something men do to women. You can clearly see this in their anti-rape campaigns. Now I will admit, that occasionally you get some feminists who admit men can also be rape victims, but they usually only talk about this in terms of male-on-male -male rape. Even rarer still is the feminists who not only admit that females can rape males, but also acknowledge that it's more common than society admits too. But for every feminist in this last category, there are at least 20, who don't think men can be raped at all. Um, wives I'm sorry, but this is why I have no sympathy for men's rights activists. Because they, they, they aren't interested in any actual, fighting any actual oppression. They are interested in keeping and maintaining their misogyny. So, there's that. Whereas Karen DeCrow, from the first segment, represented what the feminist movement should have been, Lynn, unfortunately, represents what it has become. A cult-like club, for first world westerners, to cry oppression. Let's be clear here, modern day first world westerners are not oppressed. Not men, and not women. Yes both men and women have issues, some of which are very serious, and some which are trivial compared to the rest of the world's problems. But as modern-day Westerners, we are not oppressed. In fact, we have a higher standard of living than any generation of humans which have lived before us. But unfortunately, feminists like Lynn see the world through the eyes of last-century Marxism, where there is the villain, the oppressive class, in feminism's case this role is played by males, masculinity, and the patriarchy, and we have the victim, the oppressed class. In feminism's case this role is played by anyone who isn't a straight white male, it would seem. It's a very black and white worldview, which judges a person's suffering, or should I say the sympathy given to a suffering person, based upon which class they are assigned. Ironically, for an ideology that's meant to destroy the class system, they instead impose one which judges a person's right to feel pain. The other interesting thing about Lynn's brand of feminism, is its ability to rewrite its own history. It never ceases to amaze me how they will claim they are nothing like the radicals, without even realizing that everything they believe is just a watered-down version of radical feminism. The worldview of oppressive males as part of a domineering patriarchy is radical feminism, it is extremism, and it is hate, no matter how much they try to say otherwise. Mainstream feminism is radical feminism, plain and simple. And it's those rare feminists, like Christina Hoff Summer, Camille Paglia, and Karen DeCrow who are the fringe. And unfortunately feminists like Lynn, who are ignorant about the actions of organizations like NOW, do nothing but act as a shield to the rad femme ideology. Next.
You know, quite often when making these videos, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. Seriously. I mean, what other reaction is there when you come across something, so insane, so mind-numbingly devoid of any type of reality, that you simply don't know if you should laugh out loud, assured that it must only be a joke, and that's the only sane explanation, or curl up in the corner afraid because you know it's not. Well, strap yourselves in folks, as I now press into you an article, which claims that the men's rights movement, has too much influence on mainstream feminism, and that feminism is too concerned with male issues. <laughs> yep. This will make your head explode. So let's get stuck into it. It's an article from, Tick and Daily, written by Jessica Renee Buxbaum. The article is called, Catering to Men's Rights is Not the Point of Feminism. Well if that's true, then trust me, the feminists are doing a great job so far. Faced with increasing opposition from men's rights activists, some feminists are responding by inviting men's rights proponents into the feminist sphere, arguing that feminism can help men. For example, feminists such as actor Emma Watson to bloggers on Feminspire, Huffington Post, Mick, and Bustle are replying back to men's rights activists with something along the lines of, we do care about the high rate of homelessness with men, male survivors, and all those men's issues, and we want you to join us in the fight to address it all. But this response to the backlash misses an entirely crucial point, that the men's rights movement has an opposing worldview to feminism and that to become part of a feminist movement, these men's rights activists would need to change their perspective. I will admit, that I have seen a slight shift from, men don't have issues, to, okay, it's true, men do have some issues, but, they aren't as important as female issues. Or alternatively, okay, it's true, men do have some issues, but, these issues are the fault of males, patriarchy, or masculinity, so it's their own fault anyway. You will see examples of both of these in this article, by the way. I see this shift as a slight victory, as now that men's issues have been acknowledged, albeit in a diminutive fashion, we at least have our foot planted firmly in the proverbial door. It's a start, and a better position than just a couple of years ago, but it's a long way from society taking these issues seriously, and systematic change happening. In the majority of cases I've seen, where feminist journalists acknowledge that men have issues too, it's really nothing more than lip service, and the admission is only made because they can't deny the evidence. Although many a good feminist has never let the facts get in the way. But their admission shouldn't be seen as feminism bowing down to the might of men's rights activists, because it's really only equivalent to a backhanded compliment. It's like saying, you look pretty for such a fat girl. The fact that some feminist journalists have admitted that men also have problems, followed by a long series of arguments designed to diminish the severity of those issues, could be considered, a backhanded concession. Nothing more. But it is our foot in the door, and that's a start. So let's have a look at some of the headlines MRAs have received from feminist journalists. <laughs> There is a good reason why MRAs reject modern-day feminism, and that reason is simple. All forms of feminism that prescribe to patriarchy theory, are nothing more than thinly veiled hate movements, that blame all the world's woes on males, or more often, straight white males. I have to ask, why would any sane man follow an ideology that demonizes him based solely on his gender, and actively avoids acknowledging his issues? Next. Feminism is not about fighting for men's rights and focusing on men's issues. Yes, we do need equality for all and to end gender stereotypes, but the feminist movement at its core is centered on women's rights and liberating women from the restrictions of society and male dominance. When we tell straight, white, cisgender men that they should join the feminist movement because it benefits them and achieves their goals, it discredits what it means to be a male feminist ally. We all need to take a stand against all injustice, even forms of injustice that create power dynamics that benefit us. 
feminists should not be convincing men's rights activists how feminism can solve all the qualms they have about men in society. Rather, our focus should be on the fact that women, and particularly women who occupy multiple oppressed identity groups at once, such as women of color and transgender women, face greater threats and that men are not the oppressed group in this discussion. What needs to happen is a change in a worldview, from one that seeks to suppress feminist organizing to one that understands that we must end injustice for the sake of ending injustice, not for the sake of personal gain. You know, bigoted rhetoric like this bullshit, really makes me sick. She starts by stating that we need to end gender stereotypes, and then proceeds to typecast men as domineering, and women as the dominated. She also, predictably, focuses on straight white males, why am I not the least bit surprised by that? This is just the same old bullshit. Men are the problem, feminism is the solution. Masculine equals bad, feminine equals good. And of course, only female issues count. All the while, stating that they are about equality, and against gendered stereotypes. Fucking amazing. The cognitive dissonance is astounding. In the first segment of this video I introduced you to a rarity, a feminist who not only claimed to be about equality, but actively strove for it. No hypocrisy, no bullshit, no double standards. And here we have the other extreme, the lunatics who have taken over the asylum, who yawn forth nothing but ideological hate-filled bile. As long as the lunatics run the asylum, I will stand against feminism. Next. The Resurgence of Men's Rights Organizing Feminist analysts on the rise of men's rights generally agree that the men's rights movement constitutes a dramatic shift away from pro-feminist male liberation goals into feminist blame and counteractivism. The idea of men's liberation originated in the 1970s. At that time, many male liberation proponents described their work as sympathetic to the feminist movement. They shared a critique of patriarchy and sought to emancipate men from patriarchy as well. Their movement focused on rethinking masculinity and figuring how men can fit into a more egalitarian society and evolve into new domestic roles. Oh, rethinking masculinity? Because masculinity is bad, right? I mean, why else would you need to rethink it? At least from a feminist perspective. I agree that we, as males, need to free ourselves from outdated gender roles. We need to stop seeing ourselves as disposable. We need to stop judging our worth based on being good providers. We do need to redefine some masculine roles, for our own sake. But that doesn't mean that masculinity is inherently bad, or oppressive, or that everything about it should be thrown away. Feminist ideology only sees the bad in masculinity, and only the good in femininity when in reality there are positives and negatives in both. Next. Since that time, however, male liberation activism has given way to a resurgent men's rights movement with a fundamentally anti-feminist message, the idea that feminism is to blame for the problems men face, problems such as men's reluctance in coming forward about sexual abuse or the frequency with which men are denied primary child custody. They miss the point that these realities are not the fault of feminists but rather are the fault of our patriarchal system, which feminism is trying to dismantle, that coerces men and women into damaging and prescribed gender roles. Oh I see, so now, the National Organization for Women, isn't actually a feminist organization, but the tool of the patriarchy? Really? I wonder if the members of NOW would agree? So here we have more arguments that are devoid of reality once again blaming the mythical feminist boogeyman of patriarchy for all the world's woes, without actually looking into the issues themselves. This is kind of like a fundamentalist anti-gay preacher, who is found in a motel room with two 15-year-old boys in a compromising position, and then claims, it's not my fault, the devil made me do it. I'm sorry feminists, but you don't get to excuse the bad behavior of your organizations by shifting the blame to Illuminati great red herrings. Next. This summer, over a hundred men and just a few women huddled together inside a Veterans of Foreign Wars Hall in Detroit for the first international conference on men's issues. After the conference, I saw this type of comment popping up in numerous articles, mentioning that it was mainly men at the men's rights conference, which would seem kind of logical to me. 
but I suspect these comments were made to indicate that somehow the conference wasn't friendly towards women, or somehow anti-women, or some bull like that, I mean, why else would so few women attend? It couldn't be that most women aren't interested, so it must be discrimination, in other words, the fault of men. There were similar comments about attendees being mostly white, which I guess should be expected in a country which is three quarters white, but no, must be discrimination, right? They must be racist, blah blah blah. Next. Warren Farrell, a keynote speaker, told the crowd, it's happening here. It's happening now. It's happening with us. He was referring to the men's rights movement, which centers on problems men and boys face. Farrell is considered to be the leading voice in the movement. Strangely enough, though, he was once an active figure in feminism, but drifted from the movement to advocate for men's rights instead. For him feminism was lessening equality between the sexes. But how are putting men's issues above women strengthening equality when men are already in charge? Movements that put power in the hands of societies powerless are necessary in providing social change. And once again, here we have pure, unaltered, ideology. Only men have power, and only women are powerless. Of course, reality is a little more complex than a simplistic ideological blame fest. But I find it interesting that the author, Jessica Renee Buxbaum, refers to Warren Farrell's men's rights advocacy as putting men's issues above women's. How exactly is advocating for men's rights, putting men's rights above those of women? How does stopping male circumcision take away the rights of women? How does addressing the high number of male suicides take away the rights of women? With most of these issues, it doesn't need to be a zero-sum game. Banning all circumcision does not negatively affect females, for example. I think this one comment is very telling, as it indicates that Jessica is only capable of seeing, or having sympathy for, or understanding, the issues of females. She simply does not care about male issues, as she can only see males as the problem. But once again, if I refer back to my first segment with Karen DeCrow, we see that having understanding, and sympathy, for both genders issues is possible. But unfortunately, feminism has long since been poisoned by hate-filled ideology. Next. We need to know not only why are our sons committing suicide, but also why are our sons much more likely to be the ones to shoot up schools? He said in an NPR interview later. We're all in jeopardy if we don't pay attention to the cries of pain and isolation and alienation that are happening among our sons. In truth, feminism does take seriously many topics framed as men's issues, such as high suicide rates among men, the conflation of masculinity and violence, a lack of support for men who express their emotions, and the normative requirement for men to be masculine, as has been so repeatedly hashed out within the feminist dialogue. These men's rights activists plea that feminism is fighting for women's rights at the expense of men is an unfair portrayal of feminism, one based on stereotypes about men hating feminists rather than on the reality of feminist thought and action. Does feminism discuss men's issues? The answer is, yes, in a way it does. But not in any way that I see as helpful or productive, I would argue it in fact has the opposite effect. Feminism's solution to male issues usually comes down to, it's the fault of masculinity, so just be more feminine. Once again we have, masculine equals bad, feminine equals good. Or, it's the fault of the patriarchy. Or, women's issues are more important, stop derailing by talking about your issues. Or some other bullshit like that. I don't know about you, but none of that sounds too helpful or productive to me. But Jessica Renee Buxbaum does give us a link. It leads to a Tumblr post which you may have heard before. Number one, number one, shut the fuck up for a second. Feminists do not want you to lose custody of your children. The assumption that women are naturally better caregivers is part of patriarchy. Feminists do not like commercials in which bumbling dads mess up the laundry and competent wives have to bustle in and fix it. The assumption that women... I guess neither Shanti Binks, or Jessica Renee Buxbaum, 
have heard of the National Organization for Women. Yep, just a lot easier to blame the patriarchy I guess. Next. A misguided response, Emma Watson see for she campaign. As men's rights continues to gain traction and acknowledgement, feminist writers and activists are increasingly responding directly to the movement and its claims. While I am happy to see more feminist discourse, I'm concerned that there is a lack of radical thought in the most visible and mainstream areas of feminist discussion on this topic. Oh. Not enough radical thought you say? That's funny, as I was thinking there was way too much. Next. Take. For example, the most recent case in which feminism broke through the mainstream barrier and entered the wider discussion, the moment when actor Emma Watson proudly declared herself a feminist at the UN as she announced her he-for-she campaign. Her declaration sparked a nationwide conversation on feminism and brought mainstream media attention to this critical issue. In an attempt to make feminism as inviting as possible, however, Watson catered too much to a men's rights mentality instead of defending feminism's core focus. During her speech Watson said, But what stood out for me the most was that only 30% of Hillary Clinton's audience were male. How can we affect change in the world when only half of it is invited or feel welcome to participate in the conversation? Men, I would like to take this opportunity to extend your formal invitation. Gender equality is your issue too. Emma Watson's speech was not friendly or positive towards men's issues at all. Yes, she did mention some male issues, but instead of addressing society as a whole, which would include women, she placed all blame and responsibility on males and masculinity. Essentially what she presented was just a slightly watered-down version of this article. Men are the cause of men's issues. Men are the cause of women's issues. Men are the problem, feminism is the solution. Sorry Emma, life's a lot more complex than that. Maybe Emma Watson needed to spend less research time on Tumblr, and should have read some Karen DeCrow instead. Next. In her speech, she's addressing men, asking them to sign on to a, Feminism for Men, campaign because the issue is their issue too. Forget the one in five women sexually assaulted in their lifetime, the almost impossible beauty standards women are pressured to live up to, and the prejudice women experience daily without end. This is about our boys. The feminist focus on women's rights is being gradually co-opted into a focus on men's rights. Oh no, she actually said that, the feminist focus on women's rights is being gradually co-opted into a focus on men's rights. Watson's whole campaign focuses on the importance of men as leaders, garnering their support for feminism. She asks men to, take up this mantle, so their daughters, sisters, and mothers can be free from prejudice but also so that their sons have permission to be vulnerable and human too, reclaim those parts of themselves they abandon and in doing so be a more true and complete version of themselves. Watson's rhetoric relies on familiar tropes of men stepping up as the defenders of women. Since when do I need a man to save me? Isn't feminism supposed to be about empowering women, not portraying us as damsels in distress? You know, I have to partially agree with Jessica Renee Buxbaum. But I also find her argument somewhat ironic, as she clearly sees all males as the oppressing class, and all females as the victim class. Exactly how does seeing an entire gender as victims, based solely on their gender, empower women? Wouldn't it just make more women feel like victims? Next. I've watched feminists I know praise Watson and initiate discussions of men's issues and male leadership in their blogs. I've seen my ex-boyfriends try to take center stage in advocating for women's rights. I'm frustrated that, by focusing on men as advocates and campaigns driven by male support, mainstream feminism is pushing women out of the conversation, pushing women out of their own movement. This is just hilarious. Feminism is dominated by females. Female journalists, female celebrities, females in academia, there is no chance that the movement is going to be dominated by males, or the focus is going to shift to male issues. This just shows the level of paranoia in the minds of radical feminists, where any male involvement is some plot to dominate. Well you are more than welcome to keep feminism for yourself, I want no part in it. Next. 
Watson's feminist campaign is gaining swarms of support and attention not because it is changing the mainstream feminist narrative from the focus on privileged white women's issues to intersectional issues of race, class, and sexuality, but instead because it is male-oriented. Men showing their solidarity with the hashtag doesn't accomplish much more than plastering men's names all over a movement that is not their own. What the buzz around Watson's campaign reflects is not so much male support for women's rights, but rather that many men can deem feminism to be cool and worth accepting when a privileged white woman invites male voices to be heard. How can men really show their support? Step aside. Yes, we need male allies and men to be actively working against sexism and misogyny, but it is not their turn to lead. Creating campaigns around that notion naturalizes male leadership and portrays it as necessary in combating gender inequality, as noted in the men-only meeting in Iceland for women's rights, a direct response to the Hey For She campaign. Men have been handed the microphone for ages and women told to shut up. The whole point of feminist struggle is that men sometimes need to learn how to be on the sidelines and listen. And they say feminism is about equality. So funny. Well, in the men's rights movement, we actively listen to our female members, as we judge the worth of the speaker's argument, over their gender. While over on the side of feminism, we have feminists like Jessica Renee Buxbaum, effectively telling men to take a seat at the back of the bus. Yet strangely, we are considered the sexists, while they are the ones who are considered the egalitarians. What a strange upside-down world we live in. Next. I am never going to feel comfortable going to a feminist activist meeting if the men outnumber the women and are the ones leading that discussion. It just doesn't make sense. Simply and hypocritically it is reinforcing the patriarchy I am trying to break down. Men can participate and men can rally for change, but they have to understand this movement isn't for them. Men's liberation is a quiet bonus, not the motivator for change. Millennial men feel trapped by masculinity and are affected by gender policing too, but these issues pale in comparison to the challenges women face. Saying, men too, is subtly dismissing the fact that women suffer more deeply under patriarchy than men do. And here we see the exact reason why feminism is not the proper means of dealing with men's issues. We have the, but women's issues are more important, argument. And the, patriarchy backfiring argument. And how exactly do millennial men feel trapped by masculinity? I have no doubt that many of them have been taught that masculinity is bad, by feminists like Jessica Renee Buxbaum, but that's just another reason to dismiss feminism as an effective means of dealing with men's issues. Next. Somehow mainstream feminism has started embracing male dominance and consequently in this moment feminism is being taken seriously by the world. We need to resist this dynamic and refuse to let men's rights activists shift the feminist discussion from women to men. So in this episode I have shown the spotlight on three different feminists and explored their views on men's rights. The first, who is a well-known feminist, not only acknowledged that men have issues as well, but actively worked on those issues. She was a true egalitarian, who believed in actual equality for everyone. This is what many feminists claim the movement is about, but sadly, those same feminists are far more like our next two spotlighted individuals. The second claims to be about equality, and claims to be a moderate but her constant reference to patriarchy and oppression shows that her beliefs have been influenced by the radical element. She also actively rewrites feminist history, and ignores feminists' wrongs, effectively putting her head in the sand. Not to mention acting as a shield to the more radical element. Which brings us to three. A radical, who sees any involvement by males as a threat, masculinity as a problem to be solved, and the patriarchal boogeyman as the cause of all the world's woes. She can only see female pain, female issues, and female suffering. And sees females as a class oppressed by males as a class, regardless of individual circumstances. The first feminist, Karen DeCrow, I have the greatest respect for, but the other two are just poison ideologues, more interested in their own self-imposed victimhood, 
than true equality. Well that's it folks, until next time, always remember, don't drink the poison Kool-Aid. Hello YouTube. Someone finally went and broke Godwin's law on me. And I just kind of decided I'm done. I am not going to deal with responding to nameless, faceless men's rights activist cowards. I'm just going to delete their comments and ban them. It's not because I don't enjoy a healthy discussion and discourse and exchange of ideas. It's because they keep saying the same bullshit dressed in different ways and claiming that because I don't fully support and worship their cocks or whatever, I that I'm somehow a Nazi. Which doesn't make any sense.